The Israeli Prime Minister wants a red line Iran should not cross, so he drew one himself. But beyond the cartoon and the red marker pen, Benjamin Netanyahu's UN speech shows he's serious about confronting Iran's nuclear program. Did the speech work? Did the rhetoric match the facts? This is Inside Story. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. It is the speech everyone's talking about and it came complete with visual aids. Addressing the United Nations General Assembly on Thursday, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu actually illustrated how close Iran was to building a nuclear weapon with a cartoon-style bomb and a red marker pen. His point, though, was very serious, and it sounded a warning that as long as the Iranian nuclear issue remains unresolved, Israel will keep moving towards its self-styled red line, beyond which could be a major confrontation. Iran dismissed the claims as, quote, baseless and absurd allegations. But for a few minutes in New York City, the Israeli prime minister had everyone's attention. Here's a diagram. This is a bomb. This is a fuse. Where's Iran? Iran's completed the first stage. Took them many years, but they completed it, and they're 70 percent of the way there. Now they're well into the second stage. And by next spring, at most, by next summer, at current enrichment rates, they will have finished the medium enrichment and move on to the final stage. From there, it's only a few months, possibly a few weeks, before they get enough enriched uranium for the first bomb. So the question is, among many others, what if Iran crosses Netanyahu's red line? We've got our panel from right across the spectrum to discuss this. In Tel Aviv, Dr. Renan Gissen the, was the senior advisor to the former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. In Tehran, Sadek Zibakalim, professor of political science at Tehran University and expert on Iranian foreign policy. And rounding out the panel in Washington, D.C. is Trita Parsi, the founder and president of the National Iranian American Council. Also, he wrote the book Treacherous Alliance, The Secret Dealings of Iran, Israel and the United States. So, gentlemen, thank you to all of you for joining us on Inside Story. I do appreciate it. I want to start with one question for each of you. So just brief answers at this point, if you wouldn't mind. The one question is, did this speech work? Let's start with Dr. Renan Gieson. I think it worked. I think it achieved its purpose, and, and the purpose should be clearly defined. It was to get the message across to the American audience, to the international community, and this is, of course, the best forum you have, the General Assembly, uh, and with the articulation and the capability of uh, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, clearly the message was that there is a deadline and there is a red line. Uh, and the red line is, of course, uh, what uh, he said, that there could be many others, but the enrichment from uh, to n up to 90 percent and the real deadline, you know, that you can you can say two deadlines, one uh, in the spring when they reach the spring of 2013, when they reach that point or the summer of 2013, where they can actually achieve an assembly of a bomb, what you may call a bomb in the basement. And from then, uh, there is a lot of things that can be done until then, uh, short of a uh, what uh, everybody conjures in everybody's mind, uh, an automatic Israeli airstrike. Okay, there are other things that can be done in that uh, period, and uh, if you want, I could uh, discuss them later. Uh, we will talk more about those. I want to get the view of Sadek Zibakalim now in uh, Tehran. Again, the same question, did it work? Everyone knows what a red line is now. Well, as far as um, the Iranian leaders are concerned, no, it didn't work because uh, it is not uh, the first time during the past uh, year or so, at least, that uh, Israelis uh, have used uh, threatening language against the Islamic Republic of Iran. So Iran is used to this kind of uh, language from the, the Israeli leaders. I don't think it will necessarily change anything uh, in Iran. True to Parsi in Washington, D.C. Well, I think uh, Netanyahu is a very effective communicator, but I think in the last couple of weeks he has made a lot of miscalculations. 
one of the first miscalculations was to uh, go very aggressively against Obama, thinking that in an election year he will be very vulnerable, and as a result it will be possible to press him uh, significantly. That backfired on him, and I think the second miscalculation was the theatrics at the UN. I don't think this convinced any new people. In fact, technically, analytically, the entire presentation was a mess, but I think his broader objective was to normalize the conversation about war. And in that sense, uh, he may have achieved the strategy of taking two steps forward and taking one step back, meaning that the trajectory nevertheless remains one in which get, we are getting closer and closer to a military confrontation. Excellent. Great thoughts from all our guests there. I would like you to all have a bit of a listen, and for our viewers as well, a bit of a listen to more of what Benjamin Netanyahu uh, had to say. This is when he was uh, dealing with the issue of, well, as he says, the hour getting very, very late. Have a listen. I speak about it now because the Iranian nuclear calendar doesn't take time out for anyone or for anything. I speak about it now because when it comes to the survival of my country, it's not only my right to speak, it's my duty to speak. And I believe that this is the duty of every responsible leader who wants to preserve world peace. For nearly a decade, the international community has tried to stop the Iranian nuclear program with diplomacy. Well, that hasn't worked. Iran uses diplomatic negotiations as a means to buy time to advance its nuclear program. Trita Parsi, I'll come back to you first of all. A couple of things to talk about here. One of them, the, the, the fact that, you know, he says the hour is getting late, the, there's no timetable here, but he starts to put a timetable on things. And, and Dr. Renan Gissen made this point before. He's actually saying spring next year, on by summer. I mean, are we looking at a real deadline, a real timeline here, do you think? No, I don't think we are, because at the end of the day, earlier this year, the Israeli talking points were that Iran would reach a zone of immunity by uh, spring of this year. And as a result, at that point, it would be a point of no return and Israel would have no option to attack. We've been hearing these type of talks for quite some time. Iran has crossed every deadline and red line and the Israelis have not done anything. So I think there's a significant risk of a loss of credibility on the Israeli side by continuously putting forward red lines and deadlines that they don't implement, that they cannot uphold. The only effect it does, though, is that it further pushes the debate and conversation about this to a level of hysteria in which we, the only option we're looking at are actually really bad military options rather than taking a much more serious approach towards diplomacy. The pr uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I think, was quite incorrect in saying that there's been 10 years of diplomacy. I wish there had been 10 years of diplomacy, but that certainly is not the case. Renan Kaysen? Well, I think, I think we should look back at what was the situation, let's say, five years ago or four years ago before Netanyahu started this campaign, incessant campaign, uh, you know, uh, 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 unwavering campaign to put the issue on the international agenda. And this he did almost single-handedly with the help of uh, 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 Defense Minister Barak to make the international community aware that this is a top priority issue on the international agenda. Now comes the second stage. Now you have to make certain, and that is clearly a requirement. I would say a sine qua non, that to put the issue squarely on the agenda of the leaders in Tehran so that they understand that this issue is one that fa faces them with a dilemma. Either they stop the bomb or they face consequences. By the way, the consequences are not just a military strike. The year that is left here opens a lot of, a lot of other options, ju just the military strike. There are options on the table, and by the way, there are also options under the table. The important thing is the end result, so that the leaders in Tehran will understand that Israel is dead serious, that the United States is dead serious, and that there are deadlines that cannot be crossed, a red line that cannot be crossed, because if they will be crossed, then clearly I think there are other channels to indicate to the Iranian leaders what can be done and not the public forum of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Right. Dr. Gissens made a good point that there are options. There are always options. Sadiq Zibaklan, let me put this to you, and this is something else which we heard in that clip from Mr. Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu. He said diplomacy hasn't worked. And he kind of has a point. Whether, you know, whichever side you believe in this argument, there has been no resolution, there has been no consensus. We're still pretty much in the same position. 
Well, I'm not so sure if uh, we could say categorically that uh, diplomacy has failed. We have been um, observing during the past uh, year that there have been constructive uh, negotiation. And um, uh, as, far as, uh, as far as the position of the Islamic Republic of Iran is concerned, the Iranian leaders know that, uh, uh, that uh, Israeli cannot, uh, on their own, attack Iranian um, uh, nuclear sites. In order to do that, they have to, uh, they have to uh, uh, align themselves with the uh, with United States. And uh, given the fact that we are uh, approaching uh, the election in, in United States, Iranians know that uh, Israeli cannot push uh, United States into a uh, military strike against, um, against Iran because that would, uh, that, would not, uh, that would create a lot of problems for the United States. The United States has already problem in Iraq, United States has problem in, uh, in Afghanistan, and other, uh, uh, other, other uh, five plus one ally of, of United States, I am talking about European countries, they are not supporting uh, military strike. Uh, against Iran, neither for that matter China is supporting it, nor for that matter Russia is supporting it. So Iranian will not panic by, uh, by the tone of the voice, uh, threatening voice of, uh, of Netanyahu. I'm glad you brought the issue of the United States into it because that was actually where I wanted to go next. And I'd, again, I'd like us to have a, a little listen here, not just to uh, something Prime Minister Netanyahu said, but also what President Obama said on the same topic also at the UN General Assembly. Have a listen to both of them now. Two days ago, from this podium, President Obama reiterated that the threat of a nuclear-armed Iran cannot be contained. I very much appreciate the President's position, as does everyone in my country. We share the goal of stopping Iran's nuclear weapons program. This goal unites the people of Israel. It unites Americans, Democrats, and Republicans alike and it is shared by important leaders throughout the world. So let me be clear, America wants to resolve this issue through diplomacy, and we believe that there is still time and space to do so. But that time is not unlimited. Trita Parsi, I'll come back to you, seeing as you're there in Washington DC, give us a bit of a view from America. How much can we say these two men are on the same page there? I mean, President Obama did at the end there say time is not, you know, the time will run out at some point, basically, but he still very much sticks on the diplomacy tag, and the same can't necessarily be said for his Israeli counterpart. They're clearly not on the same page. There's been a little bit of a movement by this speech, actually, by Netanyahu to get closer to the uh, American page of this. But I think part of the reason why there's some irritation on the U.S. side is because uh, President Obama has been quite serious about this issue, and he has a red line, and his red line is a nuclear-armed Iran. The red line that the Netanyahu government had, up until this speech at least, was that there should not be a nuclear-capable Iran, meaning that the, the line would be much, much earlier and potentially even a line that Iran already has crossed. Um, I think there's been a lot of frustration on the American side because the U.S. doesn't want Israel to draw any red lines for the U.S. that would determine when the U.S. goes to war. This is a decision that the American people itself needs to make, not the Prime Minister of Israel. Dr. Gisson in Tel Aviv, bearing in mind what you said before about the fact that there are options and whilst Prime Minister Netanyahu is speaking strongly, uh, he is saying, you know, there's still time to talk. I mean, again, do you think the United States will back Israel 100% on this one? Because, as Trita Parsi has just said, they aren't, right. they aren't reading from the same book at the moment. Well, I don't think so. I think they're on the same book, on the same page, but not on the same line, okay? They are on the same page. Uh, the, uh, there is a lot that is going on between Israel and the United States that is not uh, 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 available to public, uh, to public uh, review. And uh, the relationship is a much deep and, uh, deeper and involved relationship, strategic relation, economic relations, and uh, there are discussions that are going on, and that's the way it should do in quiet diplomacy. Now, I think this was the example Netanyahu actually exhausted the stage of public diplomacy in two phases. The first phase was three years ago up, till, up to this point to put the issue on the international agenda, put it in such priority that the nations of the world, even those who do not agree with the strike against uh, Iran, are 
understand that this issue cannot be ignored and must be dealt. It's not just Israel's problem. It's not just the so-called Zionist problem. It's the problem of the civilized world dealing not just with the bomb that Iran is developing, but with the whole policy and strategy of Iran, which wants to unstable the Middle East, which is using uh, things which are against uh, 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 human interest and against the civilized world in terms of democracy and uh, human rights and civil liberties and see what they're doing in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Syria. The, the problem was to focus, first of all, world attention on something that is critically uh, shared by everyone. No one wants to see Iran possessing a bomb and using that bomb, either to gain immunity for its hostile takeover through terrorist activity and or through uh, destabilizing regimes or using its measures uh, to, qu to quash and to, to quell any kind of uh, uh, uprising, whether in Iran or in other countries. So we, uh, Netanyahu succeeded in focusing the issue. Now the question is, what would be U.S. Rela uh, US and Israel strategy? I think now comes a time for quiet diplomacy. There's no doubt Israel is not going to strike before the elections. And there's no doubt that no other action will be taken. But once the election is over, the United States and Israel will review the whole gamut of options, not all of them will come uh, to public attention, but definitely will be put on the desks or on the table of uh, the Iranian leadership, where they will understand that if they continue uh, this policy, they, uh, uh, they will have to face the consequences, not only military strike, but the, the, the clear issue should be that at the end of the day, the Iranian leadership will have to decide either they stop the bomb or someone will stop the regime. Quick reply from Sadek Zubakalim in Tehran before we move on. All the time, uh, Dr. Uh, Renan Gieson and other Israeli uh, b b leaders uh, have stated categorically when they talk about Iranian nuclear program, they talk simply about Iranian uh, um, the attempt towards uh, an atomic uh, bomb. I must remind Dr. Gason that dozens of IAEA official reports have been uh, come out during the past 10 years, and none of them, I repeat, none of them have ever stated that Iran is actually in the process of developing an atomic weapon. Uh, 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 um, so I, I, I can't see where oh, come uh, on. Dr. Renan and his <laughs> colleagues <on>. are getting <laughs> this idea that Iran is developing uh, an atomic weapon. Gentlemen, I'm going to jump in there. I know you'd like to reply, <laughs> Dr. Gisson, but I'm going to jump in because we've got other stuff to talk about. The content of Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech was, and I'm quoting him here, not based on secret information, it's not based on military intelligence, it is based on public reports by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Anybody can read them, they're online, end quote. So we did. This is from the UN Nuclear Watchdog's quarterly report in August. It says Iran has doubled the number of uranium enrichment machines it has uh, from 1,064 in May. It's now up at 2,140. But it was unsure what the ultimate use of the machines would be or when they would be turned on. Uh, the report also says Iran produced nearly 190 kilograms of higher grade enriched uranium since 2010. That's up from 145 kgs in May. Uh, however, it also noted much of that high-grade uranium had been used for reactor fuel plates, or in other words, for energy. And since reactor fuel plates are difficult to reuse as warhead material, it's saying Iran's probably still a long way off the higher enriched uranium it would need for weapons. Sadiq Zibaklam, I'll come back to you again quickly. I guess the issue with this report is that, well, you can't, you, you can't dispute that Iran is enriching uranium. It's definitely doing that. But as you were pointing out, you can't really connect the dots at the moment until someone says, hey, here's a missile which we're going to put nuclear weapons into or nuclear material into. You can't connect the two. None of the reports, uh, none of the reports categorically uh, reach the conclusion that Iran is actually developing uh, the, the bomb. The reason why Iran uh, shifted, Iran moved towards uh, 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 more uh, uh, centrifuge in order to have uh, higher enriched uranium was because Iran was refused for the scientific uh, the reactor that they have. They, they need a 20% enriched uranium. And IAEA, United States, 5 plus 1, everyone else refused to supply Iran with the 20% enriched uranium that the Iran needed for that uh, scientific uh, 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 reactor in north of uh, Tehran. Trita Parsi, I'll come back to you. We haven't had a, a view from you in a little while. I mean, again, 
connecting the dots here. Until we definitively connect the dots, and they may not actually happen, is the argument sort of, I won't quite say it's irrelevant, but it's, it, it, it's not a full argument. Well, I mean, actually, the IEA report showed that the uh, level degree of uh, enriched uranium, 20% that the Iranians are producing, that the United States is very concerned about, that they have turned that into fuel pads. And once it's turned into fuel pads, it's next to impossible to turn it back into 20% enriched uranium that later on could be used for a military um, uh, bomb. So the timeline that Prime Minister Netanyahu put forward is not supported by the IEA report because the Prime Minister was making the argument that they were amassing those 20% uh, enriched uraniums, whereas in reality, according to the IEA report, they're turning it into fuel pads. All of this, nevertheless, doesn't mean that there isn't a real concern about the nuclear program that is taking place in Iran. Iran has failed to provide the necessary level of transparency to provide the international community with confidence. But this is an issue that actually can be resolved with serious negotiation, not these one-off meetings, but serious negotiation. And I'm quite convinced that the Obama administration, if they win the elections, their plan is to go very aggressively forward with diplomacy as soon as they can after the negotiations, because during the first year of the president's second term, he will have maximum maneuverability. And then the question then will be, will the ne Prime Minister Netanyahu continue to act as a problem for the negotiations by criticizing the talks, criticizing President Obama for having gone to the table, as he did earlier this year, or will he be more of a team player and actually support the process. Dr. Gisson, Trita Parsi's made the point about serious negotiations. In your view, what is the chance of that yes. happening between all sides here, whichever mediator wants to be part of it here, now that the red line is here? I, it's been... It's been over seven years that there have been attempts at serious negotiations that led nowhere. I mean, the Iranians are experts in obstructing the negotiations, on delaying. You know, in, in American baseball, there's a term to steal bases. When you can't hit a home run, you try to steal bases. The Iranians have been trying to steal bases all along on the way to their military nuclear program, which will come to fruition if not stopped. Now, you know, when Netanyahu stated the deadlines, and I said there are other options, yes, there is a possibility, two possibilities, logically speaking. One, that because of action taken by the international community, by the coalition, by the United States and Israel, they will halt the program or suspend it temporarily, or that, uh, that, uh, that they themselves will decide, okay, we'll reach just the point of the threshold of a nuclear capability, 90% only, and will not develop a bomb in the basement or a bomb on a missile. Okay, but that is something the, that takes sorry, about the point uh, six that months. I was actually so the coming whole concept, to, I'm sorry the whole to thing you. about Iran and nuclear program is they're trying to deceive the world. The point I was making is about the actual chance. You've said, okay, there's been seven years of on and off and it's not happened. What about now? What about moving forward? What about, as Trita Parsi says, once the U.S. gets past its election and whoever's yeah, in th power? There is. I, I can tell you, and I will not elaborate, if the, uh, the gamut of sanctions is expanded, not just economic sanctions on oil and so forth, but other type of sanctions against the regime, including uh, exclusion from international forums, including boycotting the Iranian leaders and those who are involved directly in either terrorist activity or in developing the bomb, and other types of, uh, I'd say, really, I'd say, biting sanctions that would change their behavior. So, and there is time to test that until, as I said, spring of 2013. Gentlemen, we've always, we always run out of time, I'm afraid. We've always got so much to talk about, and we do run out of time. But I do want to thank you all for your, uh, your time and your thoughts today. Uh, in Tel Aviv was Dr. Ren Renan Grisin. And in Tehran was Sadek Zivakalam, and of course in Washington DC was Trita Parsi. Gentlemen, thank you all for your time and your thoughts. Of course, the subject we've discussed today is very serious, but there was just something about that diagram the Prime Minister used that you know, really tickled a lot of people out there. It's just a few of the offerings from the blog Plus 972 magazine, which covers Israel and the occupied territories. Have a look at them on the left. Probably the most popular interpretation, the sort of comical Looney Tunes type bomb uh, actually exploding in the Prime Minister's face. On the right, uh, Star Wars fans will know this one, a comparison with the Death Star, which was capable of destroying entire planets. And finally, well, we all know what happens when we buy a bag of potato chips. Above that red line, there are no more chips. That's what the speech bubble says there. Probably not the reaction Mr Netanyahu was looking for, but it is undeniable proof that he got people's attention.
Thanks for joining us for this edition of Inside Story. You can send us your thoughts on this show or ideas for future ones. Our email address is insidestory at aljazeera.net. On behalf of the whole team, I'm Kamal Santamaria. We'll see you next time.